Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Mazdagi and today we're going to talk about hacker rights. I first want to give a big thank you to B-Sides Boston for having me keynote. It is such an honor to be virtually there and to be able to present this talk that goes right to my heart and I hope it, um, you know, it helps you too during this time. So I'm going to share my screen and I will turn off my camera at some point, just thought I should let you guys know ahead of time because I have to read word by word verbatim when it starts going into legality issues. Um, and the reason for that is that I'm not an attorney and I did not memorize everything. So yeah, anyway, let's go into this. Welcome to Hacker Rights, besides Boston attendees. So first I wanna say that this talk is completely dedicated to to all the hackers who've been scared to disclose, to all the hackers who've been prosecuted for trying to do something good or doing their job, to all the people who are in the fight to bring rights for hackers. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chloe Mastagi once again, and I'm an InfoSec advocate and activist. I'm also a VP of strategy over at Point3 Security and the president and co-founder of WOSAC, which is Women of Security. I'm the founder of We Are Hackers, also known as Women Hackers back in the day but a podcaster also for ITSP Magazine's The Uncommon Journey with Alyssa Miller and Phil Wiley. I'm also the organizer for the Hacker Book Club where we basically we read a new book every month and we meet every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time and the author does attend. And yes, the books are about people in the hacker community and written by people in the hacker community. And the author attends and those are mentioned in the books also attend. So it's a great opportunity to be part of it. That's my URL if you have any questions about who I am, what I do inside and outside of InfoSec, chances are it is on that URL. And by URL, I mean that website. That is my Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to follow. My DMs are always open. So let's dive into the real parts now. First things first, I want to cover the current landscape. So I know this is scary, but we're going to go into this together. So first things first, pretty sure maybe Equifax somehow impacted you or someone that you know. But did you know that a hacker warned Equifax six months in advance about the vulnerability that later caused the breach? And this is based on motherboard and also Equifax's own timeline. But the one thing to note is that we have these cases often where someone does not report the breach. And why is that? Well, First things first, that 60% of researchers don't report vulnerabilities. And this was a statistic that was discovered by Amit Elazari when she was doing her research around possibly having safe harbor for hackers. Now, another statistic that came out was in the HackerOne's um, 2018 hacker report. They actually uh, surveyed the hacking community and found that one out of four ethical hackers would not disclose unless they had a VDP in place. Now, a VDP is a vulnerability disclosure program, um, but the one thing to note is that those who did try to notify about a possible vulnerability to a company, they usually do this uh, by email or via social media, and the most common one is actually a DM on Twitter. Um, but what happens is that majority of the time is that they're frequently ignored or misunderstood, and then it can become something very ugly, which we saw recently with Giggle. So why are hackers scared? You know, besides prosecution, looking for contact information, reading policies have been such a burden to reporting vulnerabilities. Because let's be real, none of us are attorneys. We're just having to try to be one at times. We're reading what, what is okay, what's not okay. And sometimes it takes hours, days, and weeks um, to try to find the right contact information to report a vulnerability. And so it's, even if we are hired as an ethical hacker, we still are scared of being prosecuted. So there's a lot of reasons of why we're scared, is that there's a missing trust link between us and the organization that we're disclosing. And this is one of the cases. Um, so this one I tend to use quite often because it showed a researcher doing everything possible to prevent what actually ended up happening to him. So um, after DJI, the drone manufacturer uh, launched a bug bounty program on their own. So once again, this was not done by a bug bounty platform like Bugcrowd, Synac, or HackerOne. This was they decided to do their own. And at the very beginning of that, two hackers, Sean and Kevin, and Kevin's in that photo you see there, um, they saw the scope and the scope said that 
The bug bounty program covered all security issues in firmware, application and servers, including source code leak and secure workaround and privacy issues. Now, Kevin, he did email them just to reconfirm the scope that was shared, and it took them two weeks to finally confirm. So once it was confirmed, he then submitted a vulnerability. So remember, he didn't exploit, and he was within scope when he found his vulnerability, okay? Now, he was provided $30,000 for the finding. However, the agreement of receiving the funds itself offered no legal protection for him. So instead, he walked away from it. But what ended up happening was that DJI was worried that they were gonna, he was going to come after them or um, it was going to be a bad PR mess for them. So what they did was they turned around and basically brought a lawsuit to his door claiming he went out of scope and stated that he broke the CFAA, which is the Computer Fraud Abuse Act. And in return, the good news is that he kept a paper trail and decided to publish everything, all the communications that they had on his blog post, and they, they actually withdrew the lawsuit in return. It's a really good thing to read because it gives you a good idea of why it's so important to keep a paper trail. But also the one thing to note is that in the paper trail itself, the messaging that he had with DJI, there was internal conversations that he could see because they weren't aware that it was being shown when they emailed him back. Um, and they kept saying that he was a threat, a potential threat. And so that was their reaction. So once again, he was in scope, didn't exploit, but yet he was facing being prosecuted for it. Another case is with coal fire back in September of 2019, on um, the Iowa State asked the cybersecurity firm coal fire to conduct a penetration test to see if the staff could gain access um, to sensitive data or equipment. Now the two coal fire employees found a door to the Dallas courthouse open. And when they decided to close the door to see if it would lock and then attempt it, the alarm was set off, which is great, right? It works. Um, but what happened was following the protocol, the employees had to wait for the police to arrive and they had their paperwork that they were hired to do what they do. Um, and they were told they were good to go. However, one of the sheriffs came up and actually ended up arresting them and they had to spend a night in jail. And the charges were later dropped in January of 2020. But this is just another case of where we have some laws in force that don't represent what good hackers do. Instead, it puts us in a category that hackers are all terrible things doing criminal activities, so they should be all punished. So it prevents good hacking in the same ways that it prevents bad hacking. And community-wise, even though like it is a scary thing to have a vulnerability disclosure program for many companies, um, organizations, and government, they all know that it's a necessity because also people will report it regardless. So having a clear communication channel for someone to disclose something is critical for their own security. And us telling them and sharing and disclosing and whatnot, it also puts us in a threatening position because we don't know how they will react. So having a place to go to is so important. And I know program managers, they're, they're asking to be hacked at times, but not hacked badly and how they can conduct and handle situations when hackers do report something is something that they're still struggling to do at this day. But I know this overall is so scary in general. Uh, it's, it's hard being a hacker, I get it. Um, so here are some pictures of some puppies and a kid um, because you know there are some cat lovers out there. But why are they scared of us? And that's what I wanna approach with you is that overall we still have this imagery of this dark room downstairs basement i have a black hoodie on and a ski mask and, and it doesn't really represent who we are at all and because of that the thing is is that if you type in criminal hackers and ethical hackers you get these images and it looks exactly the same because the reality is that the public still sees us the same, even if you're a hacker or cyber criminal, you look the same because you are the same thing. And so these images really do hurt us for getting rights because society has this false belief of who we are.
And it's not just the imagery per se, it's also the language being used by the media. And when I say the media, I mean press and marketing. Yes, even in InfoSec, we have companies in InfoSec that use the wrong terms and use such dark imagery that don't really portray who are hackers and don't really know who is a hacker. And this still sets us up to having problems for us when we need to ask for rights. And so it's really important is to try to change the terminology being used. So if it's a bad actor, to use criminal, attacker, cyber criminal, malicious actor, instead of using the term hacker when reporting on any breaches or anything that's in a negative light of a hacker. Because to be honest with you, language and, and imagery really does impact us. Because overall, it continues to feed the fear of stereotypes and biases that exist because of socially constructed beliefs. And if you don't know what socially constructed beliefs, it's basically the things around you that have basically internalized, created um, basically ideas of how the world works. So say for example, um, you're told at a very young age um, indirectly in movies or you know, in comics that spiders are scary and, and they're dangerous. So for the rest of your life, you're gonna be afraid of spiders because you have internalized this messaging of a socially constructed belief that spider, all spiders are dangerous. But in reality, not all spiders aren't. Unless you live in Australia, let's be real. Australia can be a scary place. We have a lot of scary spiders there. But I wanna dive into fear a little bit more because it is fear that holds us back as society from really getting to know one another. So I wanna first dive into the amygdala and you probably have heard of this amygdala, um, but it's a fight versus flight mechanism in your brain. It's completely subconscious. Um, it's programmed basically a who's like me, who's not like me. So anyone who's not like me is stranger danger. And that means is if we don't have something in common, I see you as a stranger danger. And so that's the whole thing. So survival mechanism is always about who's like me, who's not like me. And those that are not like me are usually things that we have internalized believed in socially constructed beliefs about people around us, the way that they look, the way that they dress, all those things, um, or what jobs that they have. And versus who's like me, um, people that look like you and I or wear the same clothes or like the same things, we see them as not as threats. We see them as someone who's like us, so we kind of trust them. There's trust already there. Now, the thing with the hacker community is that because of these imagery that's being used and the language being used by the media, um, our public perception of who are hackers is that we're devious people, that we're somehow criminals. So we're not like them because they are good citizens. And because they're good citizens, um, they're separated from us. So they categorize us as stranger danger because they've never met us or they don't know of our story. They don't know what we do because they've been socially constructed to believe that hackers are dangerous people. And so that's one thing to remember about this. Now, how the amygdala works is that it then sends a message to your prefrontal cortex to let it know that a warning, warning, stranger danger is approaching, or a warning, warning, we need to react right away, get some ideas in your head. Now, the thing is the prefrontal cortex acts like the CEO of your brain, and it basically breaks it down into different um, ideas of what kind of actions to take next. And so you use logic and reason to basically question the threat and to come up with what is the next step. Once it comes up with the next step and it's evaluated all the options on the table at that moment, it sends a message back to the amygdala either to relax or take action. And so you might see this when you tell someone you're a hacker who isn't in the hacker community. Oh yeah, I'm a hacker or I work in the hacker community. You might notice that their eyes get a little bit bigger or their mind might just drop or they take a step back or they try to find a way how to get out of having a conversation with you now. Um, so that's usually because those are the actions that they took because of the socially constructed beliefs that have been stored in their memory. And the amygdala reacted saying, stranger danger, um, this is a hacker, a criminal, and your prefrontal cortex is like, okay, I need to react on this. I need to get out of this conversation. 
I need to do something immediately so I can stay safe and survive afterwards. And then sends the message back to the amygdala saying what action it wants. Now, the thing to note about is that because it is a completely conscious moment, you're able to actually break it down. So if people knew who are hackers and the imagery started shifting, the language started shifting, and they heard personal stories of people in the hacker community and how it's impacted them when they try to report something or how the public views them and how it's hurt them and the community, that changes things. Personal stories change everything. A personal story has so much incredible positive things involved with it. It allows us to question our biases and allows us to really see the world and how it is and understand one another. It provides us with empathy. And to be able to have empathy from the public, the public has to know our stories. They have to know who are hackers and who are attackers. And we need to work with the media to do that. So what overall, what I want to remind you is that the public can always question their biases about hackers. And of course, they have to be okay with being uncomfortable because as humans, we like to feel comfortable with our thoughts. We don't like to challenge our thoughts sometimes because we have you know, self-esteem issues sometimes, or it just, it's one of those moments where you want to feel as strong as possible, but when you find that you're wrong, um, it can put you in a very vulnerable position sometimes. So it's really important to be okay with being uncomfortable, to get outside of your comfort bubble, because when we go out of our comfort bubble, that's what we're asking for the public to do too, to understand who we are so we can bring about a change. Now, the reason why it's very important to understand fear and how fear works is that it's this mindset set by society and the people in the media that's keeping us unsafe and preventing hackers what we do well in. And more companies are becoming more open to receiving you know, information on vulnerabilities, but still 94% of the Forbes 2000 list still don't have a VDP and they may come to regret this in the end. But companies are afraid of hackers and don't wanna create vulnerability disclosures of policies because of this lack of bilateral trust amongst hackers and organizations slash government. It's one of the reasons why in particular 60% of us don't report vulnerabilities because we're scared of outdated laws such as the CFAA and DMCA. And we're gonna go into that next, I promise you. But also one of the things to take away is that when I interview attackers about why did they shift over from being a hacker to an attacker, one of the reasons that they said was it wasn't just about the pay, it was also that the public just saw them exactly the same and they would still have to worry about being prosecuted regardless if they were or were not, you know, in scope and exploiting. And to them, there was like, well, there's no point at this point if everyone's going to see me as this bad person, uh, no matter if I'm doing something good, then I might as well just do that way. And plus I get paid for it. But it's also, you can see that on the opposite spectrum from attackers becoming hackers in a sense, because the reason for that was that they were very worried about being prosecuted at some point and it would haunt them. So that's why they, they basically, they switch or they didn't know that bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure programs actually existed. And when they found out that they did, they realized, oh wait, I have a, a place where I can disclose something and have some sort of protection. This is great. Um, and so that's why it's really important to understand that. I'm going to turn off my camera now, like I promised that I said I would. Reason for that is we're going to just dive into some legality things, and I want to make sure that I know word by word what I'm saying. So I make sure that you guys are covered, you understand everything to the fullest detail, because it's important to know your rights and the laws right now. All right, so let's go into this. So first things first. We're going to dive into the worldwide legislation. And yes, all around the world has anti-hacking laws, anti-circumvention laws, and acceptable use policy. And a lot of it from all those countries have borrowed it from the U.S. So the U.S. kind of started it, and that's why we need to go to the U.S. to change it. So then the other countries follow. So the first things first, I want to dive into the current legislation. So um, anti-hacking laws in general, um, it's used uh, when a hacker goes out of scope. Um, and it's usually used to prosecute, uh, prosecute hackers. But the CFA, the Computer Fraud Abuse Act in the U.S. is a cybersecurity bill that was enacted in 1984 as an amendment to existing computer fraud law. 
which has been included in the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 1984. The law prohibits accessing a computer without authorization or an excess of authorization. Um, so remember that. But did you know that what happened was that uh, Ronald Reagan, he watched War Games, the movie, and he completely freaked out about it. And he pushed for CFA to be created and to pass forward and to be made into a law. So because he watched war games, he didn't have a conversation with the hackers, of course, right? But it's one of those reasons of, that we are where we are today because there was no representation of our community at the table when this was being enacted. <clears throat> now, anti-circumvention uh, laws, these are also known as copyright laws, but the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, is a 1998 United States copyright law that implements two 1996 treaties, the World Intellectual Property Organization. Basically, right to repair, seeing reverse engineering as a breach of property. Now, the thing to know about the DMCA is that there has not been any cases of hackers being prosecuted under the DMCA, but it does create a chilling effect. So it's important to note of it, but the CFA is the one that we have to be worried about the most. <clears throat> All right, so acceptable use policy is how many of you guys ever read your terms and conditions say for an Apple product? Yeah, I tried, I got bored and I decided to watch a movie instead, but in general, they can be so long, too much verbiage. It can confuse anyone, especially if English is not your like, let's just put this way, if, if you're learning English still, it's going to be hard on you. If you even know English, it's going to be hard for you. It's written for attorneys, by attorneys, for attorneys to understand and to be able to apply it. Um, and this is the reason why it leads to some serious miscommunication issues for hackers in the end. But overall, the main takeaway here is that these laws are completely old and out of date. And honestly, they were created out of fear, and we know about fear and how it's done. But it's very clear that there was no empathy in taking the time to understand what is actually needed and why law should only prosecute malicious actors instead of criminals and not good hackers. And this would have been solved a long time ago if they had representation of our community at the table. But the, once again, the stereotype and the biases towards uh, the hacker community prevented that from occurring. So laws do prevent good hacking the same way that they prevent attackers, and we need good hacking in the end. But I want to dive into the CFAA because I hate it, and I think you should too if you don't know about it. But the Computer Fraud Abuse Act passed in 1984 it has grown wildly outdated, and it offers prosecutors discretion to threaten huge potential fines and jail sentences for relatively undeserving violations of the computer policy. First, the CFA was written punishes exceeding authorized access to a protected computer, a phrase vague enough to inspire some broad interpretations. Another flaw in the CFA is the redundant provisions that enable a person to be punished multiple times for the same crime. These charges can be stacked on one on top of another, resulting in the threat of a higher cumulative fines and jail time for the exact same violation. This also allows prosecutors to bully defendants into sifting a deal in order to avoid facing a multitude of charges from a single solitary act. It also plays a significant role in sentencing. The ambiguity of a provision meant to toughen sentencing for repeat offenders of the CFA may in fact make it possible for defendants to be sentenced based on what should be prior convictions, but were nothing more than multiple convictions for the exact same crime. But most important to know about the CFAA, it gives companies the right to sue us. Hackers have more of fear from companies and states than the Justice Department. So the DOJ in general, they have not been going after hackers. They've been supporting the hacker community since 2013 by working with some of our organizations in the hacker community. So please note that the DOJ is not your threat. The real threat is local government and also companies. But I, you did probably notice that Aaron Swartz was on there. And the reason I want to bring up Aaron Swartz is because it's important to know of his situation and what occurred to understand the dangers of CFA being used against us. So in 2011, Carmen Artez's U.S. Attorney Office charged Swartz with hacking into the MIT computer network to download millions of scholarly articles from JSTOR. 
an act of civil disobedience meant to protest the restricted access to research funded by taxpayers. For this, the U.S. attorney brought charges that carried a maximum penalty of 35 years in prison and one million in fines. I want to pause there. Do you know first degree murder charges? The minimum is 25 years in prison and he was looking at a maximum penalty of 35 years in prison. Overall, the thing to take away from here is they were able to charge such number of years because the way CFA is written and the issue that has yet to be sorted since it was made into a law. Overall, looking at Aaron's situation, he was dealing with a 17 month legal battle, one that had no set trial date and wasn't ending anytime soon. And through source perspective, it must have been so overwhelming. With the future of the legal battle cast into doubt, Swartz unfortunately hung himself in his apartment on January 11, 2013. And following his death, federal prosecutors went on to drop the charges. His family still says to this day that the government's prosecution contributed to his decision to take his own life. It was because of what happened with Aaron that uh, legislators tried to push forward this thing called Aaron's Law in 2013. And unfortunately, it didn't pass. But the reason for that was there were some major lobbyists that basically wanted to make sure that it didn't pass. But Aaron's Law, it was trying to remove the phrase exceeds authorized access and just replace it with access without authorization, which is defined as to obtain information on a computer that the accessor lacks authorization to obtain by not only circumventing technological or physical measures designed to prevent unauthorized individuals from obtaining that information. In other words, it would also make sure that there would be no more duplicated charges, which was the case for Aaron. But overall, with improvements to legislation, we can change where we stand today. But in order to do that, we need to dive into three categories in which we've already touched on because they work together to bring about public change. And in order to have rights for hackers, we need to get the public on board. In order to do so, we need to dive into these three categories. We need the press to push for public to become aware. In other words, we need to change the language and imagery of a hacker and start using cyber criminals for those who commit unethical hacking. Overall, really separate the two. In order to help the press, organizations need to be on board with bilateral trust and having vulnerability disclosure programs. By showing they support hackers, the public changes their view in general. And lastly, to have organizations and public opinion to push and motivate Capitol Hill to get on board and update the current legislation that will protect ethical hackers. Overall, we need all three to be supporting hacker rights for it to become a reality. So how do we get there exactly? And yes, my camera's back on because I covered the legality parts. So first things first, these are the five needs how to get there, yeah. And the good news is that I have it already listed for you, so you don't have to do any further research at all. Um, but I do need you if you wanna help me out, that'd be great. Because it's gonna take us all in the community as a grassroots efforts to change how things are today. So first things first, there is this petition that has been created back in the last week of February. And this is a petition to show that there is a need for this right now. And it's broken down by hackers, politicians, organizations, and the media to understand that this is what's needed. Everything that I talked about in this talk is in that document itself. So sign it, share it. Anyone can sign it who agrees with it. You don't have to be a hacker to do it. But it's very important is that we need to get the signatures going up. Because the more signatures we have, the more convincing it looks to politicians when trying to set up appointments with them. Also check out hackingisnotacrime.org. So once again, hackingisnotacrime.org. Oh, it's basically a one-stop shop that I created with Brian. Um, basically, so you can know of all the organizations that are doing everything possible to give you rights, but also to know about what our purpose is and the people that are advocating for rights for us as well. Um, if you want to be an advocator, check out the action tab on our website. You can actually see what are the tenants, and if you agree with them, we'd love to have you as an advocate too. But it's a one-stop shop for anyone who wants to know about what is happening in the hacker rights world, and you can also follow us on Twitter at HackNotCrime. Second step is to let the press know, and how do we do that is we fact check them. We tell the press, and remind people there's a difference between a hacker and a criminal. Hackers are like locksmiths. Criminals are like burglars. 
or attackers, you could say. And that's the thing that they need to know. So anytime you see the media portraying hackers in a negative light, remind them politely that that is that there's actually a better term for that and it's attacker or uh, cyber criminal or criminal or malicious actor. Hackers are good people. We're trying to protect you. Um, and also if they use the imagery of the hooded figure and the, you know, dark, dark place, I don't know, a dark, dark room in a dark, dark corner, who knows? Anyway, correct them on the imagery too. Third step, if you work at an organization or you are basically at a company that's trying to push for hacker rights and want to uh, join the fight, uh, connect us with them because we need as many companies or organizations to partner with us saying that they stand with the hacker community and that they believe that we should have rights too. Um, also to push for organizations that have disclosure programs. If you work at a company that doesn't have one, look into it. There's a great resource called disclose.io. It's a wonderful place to get started on. Fourth step, contact your local representatives. You should know who your local representatives are and chances are you probably don't know. So uh, it's good to know who they are and update your current legislation as well. Tell them how this is impacting you and your community. And if they can help us out, that'd be great. Don't go out alone. Uh, contact uh, myself and we will put you in touch with other groups that are trying to, that have experience in talking to politicians about this subject. Also follow the Van Buren versus United States case because it is the first time the CFA is being visited at the Supreme Court. So it's a very big deal for us and it's this fall. The last step, support I am the Calvary, disclose.io, CERT Coronation Center, EFF, CTI League. Reach out to them, volunteer your time, donate if you can. These groups are trying to do whatever they can for rights for you and I. Now, the main takeaways overall, we need to push for awareness of ethical hackers and how we do it is by working together. And here are the things if you want. But most importantly, I just wanna remind you once again that change starts with you and me. We must not give up and we must continue to fight our rights because it's gonna take all of us or at least a good portion of us to push for rights and be advocates for each other. I just wanna say thank you again to Besides Boston for having me as your keynote. I am so honored that, um, to be here with you guys and a big shout out to uh, Bo Woods and Harley Gager for helping me understand a little bit more where we are in this position when it comes to the legality place. And also to Casey Ellis for really providing further insight into disclosure. Um, I, I'm so thankful for everyone. If you have any questions, I am here to answer them for you. Um, in the meantime, thank you guys again. And if you are signing off, well, I guess goodbye. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. And I will catch you guys in, I think we're going to be chatting next. All right. Bye, Rip.